So basically, we, uh, I typically divide the physical exam into looking at the animal at rest from a distance. And that when you look at them from a distance, you're seeing their normal behavior, their normal, um, uh, uh, normal behavior and normal um, physiology of work, as, as it were. Um, most of the times with cardiovascular disease, you may not notice too much different. In, in an animal with cardiovascular disease compared to other diseases. Uh, they may have a history of weight loss, for example, if, if their cardiovascular disease has been going on for, for some length of time. So you may notice that the animal looks, looks thinner compared to the other animals. But that's probably the only thing you would notice at rest uh, from a distance. Later on, when you restrain it and begin your hands-on exam, you may notice things like the jugular pulse and so on. So when you restrain the animal and you're beginning your cardiovascular physical examination, um, you want to make note of certain things. So those are listed here um, as far as what you're going to make note of. So you make note of the pulse rate and character. So most of the times, um, you know, uh, luminous don't like to be restrained and have their head restrained or their head examined. Um, as far as their pulse rate and character, you're basically looking at their jugular vein to appreciate the pulse character. Um, as far as pulse rate, um, you could go to try to find the, the, the mandibular um, artery and vein, which are right against each other, but they don't like you feeling their head too much, so you could actually go to the uh, tail, the ventral surface of the tail, uh, the middle coccygeal artery. Um, or you could go to the, to the uh, inner part of the carpus uh, to feel the median artery. Uh, but most of the time, the easiest place to go to get your pulse rate is going to be the, the ventral aspect of the, of the tail, uh, close to where it joins the body. And you'll be feeling the middle coccygeal artery. Uh, the coccygeal artery and vein are running right beside each other. Um, when you go out in the field and you get a chance to sample uh, blood from the tail vein, um, it's really going to be a mixed sample. You'll, you'll either be getting your blood mainly from the coccygeal vein or coccygeal artery because if you run close to it. But as far as getting your pulse, uh, the middle coccygeal artery is a good place to go. And as far as the rate and character, uh, we describe some of that in the, in the notes. Um, basically, uh, one thing you'll notice, for example, with the jugular vein um, is that in normal animals, you'll see a pulse in the jugular vein, but it's not going to go all the way up the neck, right? So you'll see a pulse like in the, in the distal third of the, of the neck, and it's usually, I, you, you'll only see it extending all the way up the neck if they're, you know, really excited, so if you just caught them, you know, you have to chase them all over the field and you, you wrestle them into a chute. Yeah, their, their hearts are going to be beating fast, and you may see the jugular vein um, pulsating fully all the way up the neck. But then, once they've gotten a chance to calm down, it should just be radiating up the distal third. Uh, that would be the normal animal. If they're having any degree of right-sided heart failure, for example, you'll notice the jugular vein pulsating along the entire length of the neck. So that's one thing you look for. All right. Um, as, as far as appreciating the, the rate of the, of the, um, the, the heart rate, um, uh, oh, another question I promised I was going to ask. Have you guys made your chart of normals? Those of you who have been out in the field? Absolutely. You, you, you remember you're going to do the species, dog, cat, horse, cow, goat. And then you're going to have temperature, heart rate, respiration rate, and you're going to have your normal ranges. So once you learn how to appreciate the normal range, then you'll be able to appreciate what's abnormal. So one of the hallmarks of cardiac disease, cardiovascular disease, in any species, so 
and particularly the women's, is tachycardia at risk. Okay? So, yes, it's stressful for you to catch the animal, and you've restrained it, and you've caught it, and you've given it a chance to rest, and the heart rate is still, you know, 100, 110, 120. So that's tachycardia. So tachycardia at rest is one of the hallmarks of cardiac disease. All right? So everybody's going to remember that. All right? Um, so also the minus increased respiratory rate. So, um, yes, usually with the tachycardia, um, the animal is trying to compensate for some degree of heart failure, so it's not circulating the blood adequately, so it's not carrying oxygenated blood to the rest of the body, so, so the brain tells, tells, it, tells the animal to increase its respiratory rate. So yes, um, along with you know, varying degrees of heart failure, you usually get increased respiratory rate as, as well. So, hallmark of cardiac disease, tachycardia at rest, plus or minus increased respiratory rate. As far as the strength of the pulse, um, increased strength versus decreased strength, so yeah, um, if, 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 if it was a struggle to catch them, then the strength of the pulse is going to increase, um, or you'll notice the, the, the heartbeat um, faster or more pronounced. Uh, but also if the animal is febrile or there's a PDA. Um, later on, um, tomorrow, we'll, we'll talk about PDA, patent ductus arteriosus. And that's, enough, that's one of the times where you see this increased strength. Decreased strength, so if there's uh, hypovolemia, so if the animal has lost um, blood, for example, um, or there's an electrolyte imbalance, so um, you know, it has a mineral deficiency, um, or if there's some degree of uh, uh, left ventricular failure or aortic stenosis, there may be a decrease in strength. Um, difficult to appreciate increase and decrease in pulse strength unless you're more experienced, um, but certainly you should be able to, to note uh, tachycardia at rest, plus or minus increased respiratory rate as a hallmark of cardiac disease, cardiovascular disease. Uh, we spoke about jugular vein fullness, so <coughs> if the animal has any right-sided heart failure, Usually you'll see the pulsation all along the length of the neck. All right. And then you're going to auscultate the thorax um, and look at the cardiac rhythm, rate, and murmurs. So basically <coughs> you're evaluating whether the rhythm is regular or irregular. You're evaluating whether the rate is, is increased or decreased or normal. And you'll have your range of normals in your mind when you do that. And you'll also be listening very closely for murmurs. Uh, when we get out in the pasture, we talked about the left side um, pulmonic aortic <coughs> mitral valve, um, uh, low, high, low, three, four, five, so third intercostal space, low down, we spoke about the pulmonic valve region, um, high intercostal space, uh, fourth intercostal space, we spoke about the aortic valve region, and low down um, in, the inter in the fifth intercostal space. We spoke about the mitral valve region, so no high, low, three, four, five PAM. So you're, you're familiar with that for, for all your domestic species. Um, and again, it, it just takes practice for you to be able to appreciate that you're listening to the pulmonic valve versus the aortic valve versus the mitral valve. Um, but, 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 you know, and the only way you're going to get that experience is just by repetition. Uh, similarly with the right side, uh, the tricuspid valve region, um, you'll just have to, to slowly shift your, the head of your stethoscope up and down until you get that point of maximum intensity to tell you that you're right over the valve. Am I going too fast, too slow, just right? So these are all just synonyms. Left AV valve, left atrial ventricular valve, otherwise known as mitral valve, otherwise known as bicuspid valve. And the point being that these are human terminologies. So when you look at animals, they don't really have bicuspid as in two cusps, but we, we adapt the, the terminology from human medicine. 
and right AB or tricuspid R A T. Yeah, so lamb and rat. Right. So when you're listening to the heart, um, if you're lucky, you'll hear four heart sounds. Um, I, I don't think I've ever heard four heart sounds, to be honest with you. Um, you will hear two heart sounds. You'll hear the love dove, S1 and S2. Um, occasionally, you'll hear this third heart sound. Um, one of the times you'll hear it, for example, is when you're giving a collagen fever, you're giving an IV calcium. So the heart starts beating more and more rapidly and, and more strongly. And you'll hear do do do, you know. So you'll hear three heart sounds with that. Um, but you know, theoretically, you could hear four heart sounds. Um, I don't think I've ever really heard four heart sounds. And let's see. Yeah. So so the heart sounds. Um, you know, conceptually, you think of them as being associated with the with the valves. So, so this will come, like I said, with experience as far as what is, what are the heart sounds you're hearing increased? Um, are you getting increased radiation of these heart sounds? Um, are the heart sounds decreased? Are the heart sounds muffled? So all that comes with repetition. So, so practice, practice, practice. And this, this is not just going to happen with, with, with ruminants. You're going to hear these abnormalities with, with all your species, right? So, so just practice and relate what you're learning on one species to the other species. So yes, hypovolemia or heart failure will correspond to increased heart sound. So basically the sounds will be easier to appreciate, easier to hear. 
increased radiation of hard sounds. What does that mean? So you remember that fluid conducts sound um, uh, very well, right? So it's going to conduct it over a further distance than this air. So if you have um, any degree of fluid in your thoracic cavity, so, so for example, from pulmonary edema, so an animal with pneumonia, for example, or if there's pleural diffusion, then you're going to hear the heartbeat pretty much everywhere that you place your stethoscope on the chest due to the increased radiation of the heart sounds. If the animal is very uh, fat or if there's air in the thoracic cavity, so remember air is going to conduct sounds less well than, than fluid, than, than, than liquid. So if there's a pneumothorax, then the heart sound will be decreased, it'll be very, very faint. Or if the animal is very fat, they'll be faint as well. And if there's pericardial effusion or pleural effusion, so if there's fluid around the heart, then the heartbeat is going to sound muffled. So, so this comes with experience. The more animals you have a chance to auscultate, the, the, more, the, the, the sooner you'll be able to appreciate the increased heart sounds, increased radiation, decreased heart sounds, and muffled heart sounds. Um, but, but it should also be somewhat I guess, intuitive as to why the heart sounds will be increased or decreased. Uh, so if I ask you this, you, you, you should be able to tell me, you know, if the animal's very excited, then the heart sounds will really increase. Um, if there's pulmonary edema, then they're going to increase radiation of heart sounds, and so on. Um, pain in the cranial abdomen co corresponding to the grunt test and Withers test. You guys did that already um, when, when you spoke about um, uh, what? Reticular pericarditis. Yeah, but you're a scientist. You're going to call it reticular pericarditis. <laughs> and you're going to charge your clients. Now I'm going to tell them, oh, it has heart disease. Now you're going to tell them it has reticular pericarditis. And then they'll pay you more money for that diagnosis. <laughs> yeah. I'm being facetious, but. but but you should also think, you know, scientifically. Um, you, you can break it down to your clients that that animal has heart disease, but you should think more uh, scientifically. All right. Uh, mucous membrane color, capillary refill time. Um, these also help to help you to appreciate if the animal has adequate um, heart function to pump blood through the body. Um, uh, edema in the head, neck, and brisket region will also give you an indication of whether there's uh, heart failure developing. And um, always remember that even though we teach the teach this course, you know, broken down into body systems, everything is related, right? So the cardiovascular system is related to the respiratory system. So. If you have a problem with the respiratory system, so if you know that an animal is tachypneic, so it's breathing rapidly, or it's, it's having difficulty breathing, so dyspnea, um, or if there's pulmonary edema present, then there may also, it may also be related to the cardiovascular system. So, so, um, so when you're looking at the whole animal, try not to compartmentalize and say, oh, it only has heart disease. Well, the heart is related to the respiratory system, so, so it might also have respiratory disease as well. And when you look at the abdomen again, you may be able to appreciate the edema in the abdomen. All right. So, um, so when you're doing your your history and physical examination, um, you also so so by the time you finish doing your history and physical examination, you will have identified <coughs> abnormalities um, that you want to to further work up by applying different diagnostic tests. So we're going to talk about some diagnostic tests. Um, radiographs. Um, the problem with radiographs, as you can imagine, is um, whether or not they're going to be able to penetrate um, a large uh, animal, like a cow, for example. But certainly with small ruminants, we, we, we can do radiographs just like you do with a dog. Um, just a matter of um, having the owner be willing to go to that extra step. Um, most of the time, we are able to diagnose cardiovascular disease in ruminants without having to do radiographs, because it's usually pretty apparent by the time you come in um, to, be, to be examined by you. All right, um, the electrocardiogram, ECG or EKG, 
So, uh, so we went over this a while ago um, as far as what corresponds to what. So the P wave is being generated by atrial depolarization, and then there's that PR interval, et cetera. All right. So hopefully somebody took a, took a picture or somebody's a good artist, they can share it with the rest of the class, and you'll be able to relate that drawing to, to these words uh, here. All right. Um, one of the take-homes that I want you to get from this slide is to be able to appreciate your, your uh, AD drop. So remember we're talking uh, about the electrocardiogram, so we're talking about electrical impulses that are being generated. So, it's, it's, so they start at your SA node, and then they go through your AB node, and if there's any blockage um, of the conduction uh, through the AB node, then you're going to get different degrees of AB block, right? So you guys have already gone over this with, with in your small animal cardiovascular? Mm -hmm. Great, all right, so, so I don't have to go through it again. All right, so you remember your AB block, but I will just because I'm... So, so, so remember your um, primary, secondary, and tertiary, or, um, so, so with your uh, primary AB block or first degree AB block, uh, remember your PR interval is just slightly increased, right? So that's the only uh, abnormality you see. Um, your second degree AB block, uh, remember you have type one and type two, so, your type one, um, in, in human medicine it's called winky back and bull hits. Um, human medicine, they like to name things after people, very you know, everything, everything has somebody's name on attached to it. Um, I haven't seen Mackenzie yet, so I don't know. <laughs> so, so type one, second degree AV block, remember your PR interval is getting progressively longer, and then you have a drop QRS complex.